So Chris, this looks amazing. How many pieces of information do you have on the Minnesota Orchestra in these archives? Easily hundreds of thousands. The collection altogether is probably well over five to six hundred bankers boxes. They're in um, environmentally protected storage down in the cavern. Did you say caverns? Yes, we call them caverns, we don't call them caves. Sounds like something on a Phantom of the Opera, I can't wait. Most people say uh, Indiana Jones. Okay, <laughs> right, <laughs> right, even better. <laughs> Chris? Here. Marco? There, there you, you are. are. <laughs> Hi. We're in two next. Here we go. We are in the Elmer L. Anderson Library on the University of Minnesota campus, which is the home of the Department of Archives and Special Collections, one of the largest collections of archival and rare materials in the country in a university setting. These are all full. These, These boxes, boxes are, are all full. Absolutely yep. Yep. full. Boy, I could spend a lot of time in here. Yeah. The Performing Arts Archives started in the, about the mid-1960s, and we tried to collect materials from the major um, performing arts organizations in the Twin Cities, so the Minnesota Orchestra, the Guthrie Theater, Children's Theater, Minnesota Dance Theater, um, and then a lot of smaller theaters and and performing arts organizations as well. So it's a great resource if you want to look at the history of the performing arts in the Twin Cities. The orchestra stands out as an organization that values its history. Here's the famous Sweeties box. AG. So this was to celebrate AG Owe, new music director. This is neat and it's got a nice picture. Mm -hmm. He hired me back in 96 and that just looks like charming AG. That's the way he... <laughs> So he was with everybody. In the late 1990s, the orchestra was starting to look at its history. Kathy Cunningham and Marianne Feldman and other people who had been supporting the orchestra, working with the orchestra for many years, wanted to make sure that the orchestra's legacy was protected and made available for researchers. The Minnesota Orchestra's archives is hundreds of thousands of items ranging everywhere from publicity materials and box office records to photographs of the orchestra, scrapbooks, just about anything you could think of having to do with the business of an orchestra. Look at this. So this is the 1910-1911 season scrapbook. This is before my time. So Mine too, believe it are. or not. <laughs> and Minneapolis prides herself on her music. I love that. Here's an October 16th, 1910 clipping that says orchestra concerts for the school children among the possibilities. Among the possibilities. They so, were at least thinking about it yeah. in 1910. Yep. Okay, well, that's a huge part of our mission. So the concert so, is brilliant. Okay. Obviously, they didn't keep the bad review, maybe. but <laughs> The materials in this library are available for anyone to use. We have researchers who come from all over the world to use materials here. We have lots of photographs of conductors. I know these guys. So we have Dimitri Metropolis. Dimitri Metropolis is one of the big names of his day. I overlapped with some of the old guys who either worked with him or new guys that worked with him, and he was incredibly generous. Apparently, really? if a guy didn't have enough money for rent or whatever, he would give them a loan. That's impressive. And, yeah, especially in the old days where a conductor was a dictator, kind of tyrant. You hear, you hear bad stories too, but sure. <laughs> I've only heard good stuff about Dimitri Metropolis. That's when he was conducting. <laughs> That's really quite dramatic, as is this one of him apparently on top of a he's mountain. Mo he's mountain climbing. The jacket's torn. I mean, it looks like he fell a couple of times. <laughs> You tell me about this lady, Jenny. Her name is Jenny Cullen, and she was the first female musician in the orchestra pre-World War II. Orchestras were almost exclusively males for up until about the 70s. Mm -hmm. So this is really unusual to have her uh, a member of 
at, at what was then the Minneapolis Symphony. Mm -hmm. um, there's another lady over yeah, there. Yeah, so table. we have another first here. This is Mrs. Carlisle Scott. She was the first female manager of the orchestra uh, from 1930 to 38. And so this was during the time when the orchestra <clears throat> was dubbed the Orchestra on Wheels because we did so many tours. railway tours. Mm -hmm. They had their mm -hmm. own Pullman cars and they would go all around the country. There's a great photo in Orchestra Hall lobby of when one of the, the, the tracks failed and there's cars overturned oh, wow. and everybody's fine. They're just standing there. <laughs> in 1957, the orchestra did a tour in the Middle East. This is one of two scrapbooks put together by Stephen Zelmer, who was a trombonist. He's got some stamps here, some clippings about the symphony playing for the Shah. Well, and there's a nice picture of the actual performance in Tehran. Wow. Well, here's Greece, Minneapolis Symphony Orchestra's first overseas concert at the Herodes Atticus Theater in Athens. And there they are standing on the tarmac, September 5, 1957. The Minneapolis Symphony did so many great things, especially across the country, but then taking this across the world, I think it was kind of us being ambassadors for Minnesota. Absolutely. That's kind of what touring is about. It's about showing the world what you can do. And recording projects are to have easy access for our listeners and perhaps get a Grammy or something and get accolades like that. Here we have a letter from Sibelius to the Minneapolis Symphony Orchestra thanking them for playing his works wow. in honor of his 90th birthday. August 26, 1955. Dear Sirs, to my great pleasure, I have learnt that the Minneapolis Symphony Orchestra is to perform my works on December 9 in celebration of my 90th birthday. Profiting of this opportunity, I send your fine orchestra and its famous conductor, Mr. Antal Dorati, my kindest regards. I am happy that my music will sound through your medium to the music lovers of Minneapolis. Wow. He was just one of the giants of the early 20th century. And it's wonderful to see this letter and this signature right here in front of me, having just, you know, we recorded all the Sibelius mm -hmm. symphonies with Osmo. Mm -hmm. And Osmo has been the, you know, considered the leading interpreter of Jean Sibelius's works. Very cool. Well, I am personally very grateful to the University Archives for keeping all this stuff for us. And I mean, just to see all the boxes downstairs in the caverns is so important. I mean, because if you don't know your history, I mean, who are you? Chris, I just found something that's like really important to me. I'm not kidding. This is amazing. You have stuff on the stagecoach players. And my dad, even my mom were part of the stagecoach players before I was born. Photo books. Chris, can I take this home with me? No, bring your dad in. 1966, there he is. Bingo, this is my dad, Vern Sutton. Do I look anything like him? My dad, Vern Sutton, he was a fixture here for so long, head of the music department for at least a dozen years, and then the director of the opera department for at least four decades, and a professor here for a very long time. Oh, dad died again. <laughs> does he do that a lot? It's, he does that a lot. You know, it happens every night in this show. I'm going to come back. Okay. I'm going to bring Dad. You bet. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. 